This video is about overlanding. It's about camping, exploring, photography. But it all happened because of this dog. We adopted him just before we took this trip. And it's the best thing we ever did. Adopt, don't shop, and give a senior dog a chance. They're awesome. This route was designed for a buddy and his photographer wife that lived too far to make it practical to bring their own rig to Colorado. The plan was to fly into Denver, rent a stock forerunner or jeep at the airport, and go overlanding in search of photo ops. He was reading Blue Highways by William Least Heat Moon and was inspired to take the trip on Colorado's Blue Highways, but instead of focusing on local cuisine like the book, they wanted to see local Colorado historic and memorable places that aren't in vacation guides or popular on social media. This route was born from that idea. Highway 40 is a beautiful winding road that's going to drop almost 2,000 feet over the next 17 miles to our first destination. During ski season this is a busy road, but on a weekday morning in the fall it's an easy, peaceful drive. The further away from the interstate we get, the quieter it becomes. We're using this trip to bond with our new shelter dog, and I'm really not much of a photographer, but this is the photo safari, and our first major photo stop is coming up on the outskirts of Winter Park, the abandoned railroad trestles of Moffat Road. Moffat Road is an easy graded dirt road with great views of the Winter Park ski area. It's all uphill and we'll gain about 2,500 feet by the end. This is the first trestle at Rifle Sight Notch. There's a short hike to it from the road. The second one is more detailed and it's right next to the road. Even the warning sign is picture worthy. There was a train depot, hotel, store, and workers quarters here until 1929 when the railway was decommissioned. Remnants of the buildings can be seen scattered along the mountain sides on the hike to the Needles Eye Tunnel. The hike follows the old railroad grade. The tracks were removed and recycled into military equipment during World War II. The hike culminates at the Needles Eye Tunnel. The tunnel was closed in the 1980s due to falling rocks and someone was injured. There was a lawsuit. Some mitigation has been done, but it's too dangerous to enter. As cool as the tunnel is, this hike is about the journey, not the destination. To get to the tunnel, you have to walk over two of these. They are called the Devil's Slide Twin Trestles. The side of this mountain is the infamous Devil's Slide. The drop-off is about a thousand feet. You can see it through the boards as you're crossing. At this altitude, the wind is always strong and the old structure creaks and shifts as you walk. It's scary, but you can take some comfort in the knowledge that during its last maintenance check in 1929, everything was fine. 
that was the short one. This is the long one. This is the town of Fraser. The winters are so cold here that it is known as Colorado's ice box. <laughs> These are the last services we'll see for over 100 miles, so we got gas here and uh, some snacks. We left town going west on Eisenhower Drive. At the end, uh, it turns into Carriage Road, and then we make a right on 73. Crooked Creek is part of a small network of roads that um, are primarily used for recreation up here. It starts out with a few residences, but soon becomes just a beautiful drive in the country. Meat Kicks. We just adopted him a week before we took this trip. After my last dog passed, we decided to get a small female puppy, and well, there she is. Eleven and a half years old, 107 pounds. He's an amazing dog. There are a lot of dead trees here. Colorado's been in a drought for the last 20 years or so, and the pine beetles have killed a lot of the trees in the area. With the drought, the trees don't get enough moisture to produce enough sap uh, to fight the pine beetles off. That's their natural defense against them. And, well, the effects are pretty rough. We're going to go left here down to Kaiser Creek, but the whole area is nice. If you turn right up to Beaver Creek, that's really cool, too. There's a lot of camping in this area. Both of the little spurs up to the right there and this one down to the left are areas where you can bring a camper in, like an actual trailer. It's a very popular um, area for fishing, so people bring stuff like that here. As we go down the hill, we're going to get closer and closer to the creek, and you can see that the trees are getting healthier. There's more water, so they have better defense. There's camping along here too, these pullouts on the left, and they're so nice we just really couldn't help ourselves. The campsites here are really cool. There's places to hang your whatever you want to hang, fire rings, um, the creek runs right next to you, and the smell of these pines is unbelievable. All right, we're going to follow that guy. We are going along Kaiser Creek down to where it intersects with the Williams Fork River. This is the Williams Fork River. We're going to actually follow it up to the Williams Fork Reservoir after this. And that's the Horseshoe Campground on the right. It's an established campground, but a really nice one. We are not going to any of those places. <laughs> We've 
got some rain coming in as we're getting close to the reservoir. There's a saying in Colorado, if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes. This area is just so beautiful, I'm going to let it speak for itself. Nice boat, dude. Nice truck, too. All right, we're going to get onto Highway 9, but just for a second, we're going to get right off. And this is Trow Road. Trow Road is one of the best dirt roads in Colorado, and it's primarily used to access the Colorado and Blue River. It's very popular for fishing and rafting. This is a bald eagle chasing a red-tailed hawk. I couldn't believe it was happening. I shoved my phone out the window and it, it didn't focus very well. So sorry about the resolution, but wow. There's a small paved section of road right by the Gore Canyon overlook. This area would be so treacherous if it wasn't paved in the winter time that you wouldn't be able to use it at all. The pavement ends again right after the overlook. At the end of the road is a place called State Bridge. State Bridge was a, a rental area with cabins, yurts, camp spots, um, a little store, but it's currently up for sale and not in operation, so it's tough to really say anything about it. Hopefully it'll open up again.
Colorado River Road runs obviously right next to the Colorado River. There's also a set of train tracks that runs down next to the road. And if you're lucky enough, you can be on this road at the same time as a train. They go about the same speed here as the cars do and they're right next to you. It's a really cool experience. There's also a lot of hay fields out here. This is largely ranch land and for the bulk of the road you'll have ranches and hay fields on both sides. This area is also very popular for fishing and rafting, and the guy that lives on the end here has a nice side hustle going selling ice. If you look at where his ice sign is, just behind it, you can see across the river there's an old stanchion from when a bridge went across. The other part appears to be right behind where his ice sign was. Now we're coming down towards the little town of Burns. If you look down to the left here, there's a building on the water. That's a Baptist church. Eventually the pavement resumes, and now we're going to start looking out for Red Dirt Creek open space. This leads to a very cool little park and also connects to another uh, trail derby mesa that comes back to Colorado River Road, but we're not going up that far today. It's just a really beautiful place to stop. My camera's having trouble focusing, it's so beautiful here. We are driving in an Xterra that's largely stock, um, and the tires are hand cooked during the proves. They're a good all-terrain, but you can see the road is pretty rutted and it's getting muddy. It gets a little much for us after a point, so we decided to turn back. We really just wanted to find a nice place to stop and get the dog out. I mean, this is a nice spot. Red Dirt Creek was a beautiful stop. There's a Subaru guy coming in here. I'm always impressed with the Subarus, where people are willing to take them. Go get it, dude. You can see on the right here, he's heading in. And if you look to the left, a bird jumps out of the grass and into the water. That is an American Dipper. They live only near rushing waters, and they are America's only aquatic songbird. Of ranches in this area and when you have a lot of ranches you have a lot of people that work seasonally or move place to place so you'll see a lot of trailers around 
I have to say, if you have to live that kind of nomadic lifestyle, this is really a hell of a place to do it in. Now we're driving next to the historic Colorado River Ranch. It's been here for a long, long time, and it was a very big operation. So large back in the day that they had to have their own schoolhouse. Now it's a really cool place you can stop. You're not allowed to go into it, but you can walk up to it. So that's what we did. This is Coffee Pot Road. If we were in my Jeep, or if we had another vehicle with us, we would go this way. It's really, really beautiful. The road winds up around the side of the mountains. It's shelfy at some points, but it's never difficult. People take Subarus up here. And if you continue on up to the top, there's a beautiful lake, but it also intersects with Transfer Trail. That's a legitimate 4x4 trail, but it gives you beautiful views of Glenwood Canyon and drops you down into Glenwood Springs. It's also very remote. It goes up on those hills on the left, and it's just really not the right choice for today. So we're going to head down to the end of Colorado River Road and pick up Interstate 70. I usually avoid the interstate like the plague, but it's only 37 miles. We're going to drive through what I think is the best part of Interstate 70, Glenwood Canyon. And if there's no traffic, it should be a pretty good drive. This is a parking area for rafting and fishing. We're really just looking at everything we can before getting on the highway. But there's really no more putting it off. Here we are, Interstate 70. Of course. Well, it happens. Um, you can see how beautiful Glenwood Canyon is already. There's a whole PBS special about this, um, about the construction of this highway through the canyon. It's considered an engineering marvel. The canyon is absolutely stunning. This area down here is a bike path that goes through it, and there's a music group called Music Travel Love that has a video that you film down there called I Will. It's really good, I'll link it in the description. So Glenwood is beautiful, but if you look at our speedometer down the lower left hand corner, you can see this is just bumper to bumper traffic.
So once the traffic cleared up and we actually started moving, it's incredible how good eight miles an hour can feel. Um, but it is a beautiful drive through here. You can see the bike path down on the right here. And soon enough, we're out of Glenwood Canyon. On the right here, you'll see a lot of cars parked. They are parked for the hot springs and the vapor caves, which are right next to the highway. Glenwood is a pretty big town. Anything you need is probably there. And these are the quiet highways out west. There's a truck here with tape hanging out the back of the thing. That's actually caution tape. How's that for irony? <laughs> Well, it's really nice to get off the highway, and now we're going to get onto Silt Colbrand Road. I had trouble finding information about this road. Um, we kind of took it on a leap of faith, and it was absolutely fantastic. It weaves through all kinds of uh, ranching, farming areas, a lot of hay fields out here. Notice we've made a few turns and I haven't said anything about it. Route finding out here is incredibly easy. There is a sign at every intersection pointing you to Colbran. We happen to be on Halls Gulch Creek right now, um, but it doesn't really matter. Just look for the signs at every intersection. There's one. <laughs> if you look in the distance, the flat top is where we're headed. That is Grand Mesa. So the pavement's going to end up ahead here, and now we are in the White River National Forest. There's some kiosks around that show you the area. There's one a little further up we can see better. I'll get a clip of that. The road surface out here is interesting. This is bentonite. It's only really found in the western part of Colorado and into Utah. It's a type of clay that's very sticky it's used industrial adhesives and it gathers itself so if you get it on your tires it'll make your tire bigger 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 until it clogs up your wheel well you cannot drive on it if it's wet if it's dry it's hard and easy but if it's wet it's impassable so there's kiosks around that show you different uses for the area camping and such and then we come up to these epic signs we're about to enter the grand mesa national forest and we're leaving the White River National Forest. This area is so beautiful, I'm just gonna let it speak for itself. Mm -hmm. 